Let us look at the third step in solving the transportation model. The third step is testing initial feasible solution for acceptability. The table that you see on the screen is the initial feasible solution that we obtained after step 2 using the Vogel's approximation method. In this initial feasible solution, we have made some allocations to determine how much quantity should be shipped from each plant to each distribution center. However, this may or may not be the ultimate optimum solution that we want to arrive at. So in order to test if this is an optimal solution or not, we have to first test if this initial feasible solution is acceptable to perform an optimality test on it. So this initial feasible solution can be tested for optimality only if it meets the two conditions that we are going to discuss in this video. If the initial feasible solution does not meet the two conditions, then it is considered a case of degeneracy and we will discuss the case of degeneracy in detail in a different video. So the first condition is that if we consider the transportation table to have M rows and N columns then the number of allocations should be equal to m plus n minus 1. So in our case we have three rows so m is equal to 3 and we have four columns so n is equal to 4. So as per this condition the total number of allocations should be equal to m plus n minus 1. So that is 3 plus 4 minus 1 which is equal to 3 plus 4 is 7 minus 1 is 6. So in our case we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So in our case this condition is being met satisfactorily. Now the second condition says that the m plus n minus 1 allocations should be in independent positions. So now what does this mean that the allocation should be in independent position? So that is it is not possible to change any individual allocation without either rearranging the positions of the allocations or violating the capacity and demand constraints. So the independent position means that it is not possible to change any individual allocation without either rearranging the positions of the allocations or violating the capacity and demand constraints. 
So what this means is that if you change any of these allocations, then either you'll have to allocate to a box which is not yet allocated or you'll have to violate either the demand or the supply constraints. Let's take an example here. So let's say we try to reduce this 5 to 2. So instead of A shipping 5 units to Q, let's say A is supposed to ship 2 units to Q. Now since the allocation here has reduced by 3, the supply constraint is not being met because we have one unit from A to P and two units from A to Q. So if we reduce here from five to two, we have to add these three units to this box. So this becomes four. Now since we added here three units, the demand constraint for P is not being met. So now the allocations for P is four plus six, which is 10. So if we have four allocated to AP, we have to reduce CP by three units. So this becomes three. Now, when we reduced five to two for the cell AQ, we were in violation of the demand constraints at Q because the demand is for five and we allocated only two to the distribution center Q. So now to balance the supply constraint at C and the demand constraint at Q, we'll have to add or allocate three units to the cell CQ. So now you can see that the demand and supply constraints are met. However, we had to rearrange the positions of the allocations because earlier we had not allocated anything to the cell CQ, but now we had to allocate three units to CQ. So this means that the original allocation was in independent position because in order to change any allocation, we had to rearrange the position of the allocations. Now, another simple way to identify if the allocations are in independent positions or not is that it is impossible to travel from any allocation back to itself by a series of horizontal and vertical jumps from one occupied cell to another without a direct reversal of the route. I'll repeat again. It is impossible to travel from any allocation back to itself. So let's say we are starting from here. This is an allocation and we are doing only horizontal and vertical lines from one occupied cell to another. So we can only turn at an occupied cell. So if we have to close the loop, that is we start from this allocation and we travel with horizontal and vertical lines and we turn the horizontal or vertical lines only in the cell where there is an allocation. It is impossible to complete the loop back to the original cell without a direct reversal of the route. So let's try. So from here, let's say we move to this cell AP because there is an allocation. Now this was a horizontal line. So here we can move, we convert this into a vertical line. So we move to cell CP. Now from here, the next allocation is CR and CS. So we can go to CS. Now from here, we have to go back to AQ. So the only allocation now is BS. So we can move this line to BS. But now there is no other allocation to help us move back to the cell AQ. So this means that we were not able to reach back to the cell from where we started without reversing the route. So now we can reverse the route, but that means that this allocations are in independent positions. Now let's consider an, an example where the allocations are not in independent positions. So let's consider this case. So there are four sources of supply and six destinations. And these numbers in these cells indicate the allocations. So here, if we start from this cell two, three, 
we can move to cell 2 2 then to 3 2 then to 3 3 and then back to 2 3 so since we were able to go back to the original cell from where we started without reversing any of the lines this is a case where the allocations are not in independent positions and we are able to form a closed loop. So if these two conditions are met, then we can proceed to step four, which is to test the initial feasible solution for optimality. So again, remember that this is not a test for optimality. This is to test if the initial feasible solution is acceptable to perform an optimality test on it.